so before we uh, kick off and we talk about building data pipelines, a few words about me. Uh, my name is Marco, nice to meet you. Uh, my background is uh, software engineering. I've been uh, a developer for seven or eight years before uh, kind of going back to school and uh, uh, getting my PhD in information retrieval. So today I like uh, uh, to build uh, search applications and uh, in general natural language processing applications. And I try to kind of merge uh, the best of both sides, the engineering and the research side. Uh, in terms of stuff I'm working on right now, I'm uh, uh, wrapping up my first uh, book on uh, data mining for uh, social media in Python, so should be relevant for the PyData crowd, and uh, it will be out over the summer. Uh, so the starting point of this talk, um, I have to say initially when I was writing the proposal, I was thinking about uh, an introduction to Luigi, which is one of the tools I'm going to mention. Uh, but then I took a step back, kind of trying to look at the bigger picture. Things got a bit uh, on the philosophical side. So the starting point is uh, R&D is not engineering. Uh, and I think we can, uh, we can all agree on, uh, on this. Uh, so of course, uh, in, well, I'm using R&D as a, as a kind of a catch-all terms for academic research, applied research, uh, data science and data science stuff. Um, I just want to check with you um, how many in the audience are software engineers, software developers, a few, yeah. And uh, who is on the R&D or academic research side? Okay. So a decent split. My point is uh, the good results of uh, R&D, when they go in production, they are definitely high value. So how can we ease the transition from R&D to production? A little bit of uh, uh, wisdom from, uh, from Twitter. If we apply the 80-20 rule to our industry, 80% of the time spent uh, uh, cleaning data and uh, the remaining 20% uh, complaining about uh, the need of preparing data. It's not far from, uh, from reality. And, uh, the take home message from this is uh, really, you know, I've been, uh, I've been talking to a lot of people in, uh, in the industry and uh, whether they have big data or not doesn't really matter because they all have big problems with data. So uh, what I'm trying to say here is uh, data preparation, data cleaning, data quality, data governance, uh, whatever you call it, it's really still a very important, uh, a very important point here. So it's where most of your effort uh, are going to be spent. Now, if you take a, a, a traditional database uh, uh, textbook and uh, we look at, at the data warehousing terminology, we find ETL as a, as a classic uh, way to represent uh, basically everything that happens before we can do our smart analytics. So ETL for extract, uh, transform, and load. Uh, it's never so simple, so it's never so linear. Usually we have many, many components in the um, ETL side, uh, we need to extract uh, data from uh, many heterogeneous sources. We need to clean data, deduplication, uh, missing values, all these sort of uh, problems. Uh, then we might want to apply some data augmentation, data tagging, whatever you call it, and then join at the end uh, multiple data sets. So potentially the, this ETL box in the, in the middle uh, can get really complicated. And this is everything that happens before uh, we can run our machine learning application or data analytics in a broader sense. If we build uh, data pipelines, we might as well uh, build a good data pipeline. And uh, <coughs> in my opinion, there are, there are two key points to, to keep in mind. So a good data pipeline is something that is easy to replicate. So we can share it with colleagues and we can replicate experiments. So replicability in, uh, in science, uh, generally speaking, is a, is a good idea. And also, a good data pipeline is something that is uh, easy to bring to production, so easy to productize. Uh, so the question is, how, how can we do that? So moving, keeping this in mind, replicability and uh, easy to productize, uh, if we move uh, towards good data pipelines, what do we need to do? Uh, a few, a few um, kind of real, real life uh, uh, experiences. Uh, data transformation 
keep your data as a, as a suggestion. Don't override your data. You should always be able to rerun the pipeline uh, from the beginning. Th that's about uh, data sanity in general, but more, more specific specifically about your own uh, sanity when you try to replicate experiments. Uh, if we follow design of Python, you know, uh, simple is better than, uh, than complex. It's better to start uh, simple and uh, add complexity later. In particular, at some point, we're gonna need to break down uh, the uh, pipeline into individual components. And uh, if we're talking about Python, uh, we can break it down into individual packages, so applying you know, the setup.py uh, setup tools kind of a library. And uh, rather than having a big uh, data pipeline, uh, break it into smaller components. And uh, one more suggestion, as soon as possible, try to get uh, an end-to-end -end, uh, test of your pipeline. So the components of your pipeline should, uh, should work well in isolation, but they should work well as a pipeline. So end-to-end -end test uh, as soon as possible will, uh, uh, will kind of give you, um, we kind of raise the problems if, uh, if they are there. You shouldn't forget about uh, testing uh, the components in isolation anyway. So unit testing is still uh, very important. Uh, now, as, the, as a, the process of building pipelines, I've seen uh, master students, PhD students, and even more, uh, more senior uh, people going through the same kind of uh, pattern and the same kind of mistakes. So you start with a script, and then uh, you hack something together, and then you have a bunch of scripts that individually they don't really make sense, so you have what they call a, um, a script soup. And then uh, in order to uh, try to make some, uh, some sense of this uh, big soup, you maybe write a, a kind of a master script to run everything. And uh, what you end up with is really a, a sort of a hacky, homemade uh, solution where you reinvent the wheel and uh, things are still flaky and difficult to, to share and difficult to rerun. So what we mentioned before about replicability and uh, going to production is really not there yet. In terms of... Uh, don't reinvent in the wheel. Uh, there are many tools out there to, to manage uh, pipelines, co complex pipelines, and I'm going to mention one in a moment. Uh, before going there, I just want to talk a bit more about testing. Uh, so another question for you, who is, uh, how many of you are every day writing unit tests? Exactly. <laughs> So this rant is for you. <laughs> so testing in the broader sense and uh, unit tests in particular. Uh, generally speaking, people think unit testing is a good idea, but they don't put it in practice. And uh, unit testing in Python is, is quite simple. You have the unit test package part of the standard library. Then you write your test, and then you quit complaining about the lack of time to write tests. And the, the last step is really optional. Uh, as long as you do step one and step two. Uh, to answer your question, unit test uh, is a, a test uh, that writes, uh, you write a test for the smallest components, so you, you test uh, the smallest uh, assumption uh, and you want to validate the smallest assumption. Uh, so the benefits of uh, unit testing, basically uh, you create a, a safety net uh, because every time you touch something in your code, uh, you're risking uh, big problems, basically. You're gonna break something else. You touch something, you break something else. And uh, your unit tests, if, if uh, you write a decent set of tests, uh, are uh, <coughs> protecting you from this kind of mistakes. And uh, it's particularly useful to have uh, a good set of tests, uh, say, on a Friday afternoon, when you need to touch something and uh, you don't want to stay late in the office. Uh, we can look at the unit test uh, then as a way to validate your assumptions. Uh, you have your, uh, your code, your functions, so you think in terms of uh, input and expected output. Right? So you validate your assumption, data types, and so on. And uh, you can look at uh, unit tests also as a way to communicate your intention. So if, you're, if your code, if your piece of code uh, is a black box, input and output, uh, you write down your expectations in terms of uh, unit test. Uh, unit tests are also useful in terms of uh, software design. So if something is difficult to test, uh, 
probably you can refactor it and make it cleaner. So that's what I mean when I say it's, you, you're forced to think. So you're forced to think about what you expect, input and output again. Uh, if you are on the academic side and you say, I don't write a production code, so I don't really need to write any, any unit test. Uh, say you're writing a paper, you write your analysis, and uh, you end up with some numbers. These are taken from a, from a real paper. Uh, do you see the problem? Precision and recall, common in, uh, in machine learning, and then you calculate the F-score, which is the um, harmonic mean of precision and recall. So you expect the number to be in between precision and recall. So this is out of bound. And uh, I've seen this in a paper published in a, in a A plus conference. So how we can, uh, how can we um, work around this problem if we are in the process of writing some analysis and we need to test our numbers? It's really uh, one line of Python. So you calculate your, your F score, your precision and recall somewhere, then you sort out uh, which one is the lower bound and the upper bound, and then uh, the third line here is an assertion where you validate uh, your assumption. So the assumption here is that the F score is uh, somewhere in between uh, the other two numbers. So the unit test uh, is uh, just testing the smallest of the assumption. We don't know if the precision and recall values are correct. We don't know if the F score is correct. We just want to check whether the F score is between uh, precision and recall. Uh, if you've never seen a unit test before, this piece of code alone is not a unit test. You still need to write uh, the uh, boilerplate code, uh, so a, a test case class and, uh, and your function. But that's pretty much it in terms of logic. Also, you should use the assertion from the unit test package that I mentioned earlier. But it looks pretty much like uh, a unit test. So the, the message here is uh, writing a single unit test is really, really, really simple. You test a simple assumption. And uh, you want to test uh, the smallest possible unit. You don't want to, to have, a big, have the bigger picture in a unit test. OK. Uh, so I'm nearly done with the, with the discussion on the unit test. Uh, some uh, suggestions if you are just starting with unit testing. So the approach of uh, slotting some assertion in your code uh, rather than writing the unit test is called sometimes defensive programming. I'm not particularly uh, a, a great fan of defensive programming, but if you don't need to write production code, so you just write a script and you're the only user of that script, uh, that's one way to do it. So you don't need uh, the unit test package. You just put uh, assertions here and there. And uh, if the uh, condition is not valid, uh, the assertion will uh, blow up and uh, raise an assertion error. So it's one way to check uh, if your assumptions are correct. I prefer unit testing uh, coming from a, from a product-oriented uh, point of view. But this defensive programming is also one option. Uh, if you put some effort in writing tests, uh, you should avoid a couple of things, in particular tautologies. So tautologies is when you repeat yourself. So you write something that doesn't add any extra value. For example, if you write your logic in the unit test and the test is wrong, you don't know if, uh, if the bug is in the test or in the original function. So you should really treat your code as a black box. Input, output, expectation, nothing more. You, you shouldn't write any logic uh, in the unit test. Uh, and then vanity testing is, uh, is what happens when uh, you start buying into unit tests. You think it's a good idea, you like it, you start writing unit tests for everything. And uh, you don't add any value, right? So unit tests should be useful, should tell you something. You shouldn't just write tests for the sake of it. In particular, um, there's a concept of coverage, which is the proportion of lines that are touched by any unit test. You shouldn't use coverage to, to say, look, I have a high coverage, so my unit test is, uh, sorry, my code is well tested. You, sh you should kind of think the other way around. Use coverage tools to highlight uh, which portion of the code is not tested yet. And uh, this discussion about coverage also goes into knowing the ecosystem. So we have unit tests as part of the standard library, and then we have a whole bunch of uh, useful libraries for testing. We have PyTest and Nose uh, that kind of collect um, 
your test and uh, allow you to run tests in, in different way. You have coverage.py for the uh, coverage. You, have, you also have a nice uh, GUI uh, that highlights what, what you have tested and, uh, and what uh, you haven't. You know, green line has been tested, red line it hasn't. And then we have a hypothesis, uh, which is a library to define strategies for your tests. So you can really uh, kind of brute force uh, your, uh, your unit tests. You define uh, what kind of input you want, and then the library will produce any sort of random rubbish that could potentially go through your function. And uh, it will help you to highlight uh, the edge cases that you didn't think about. OK, so I, I ran out of quota in terms of ranting. And uh, I carry on with the workflow managers that I mentioned earlier. So uh, I want to introduce Luigi. Luigi is a Python library. It belongs to the, to the family of uh, workflow <coughs> managers. If you are familiar with Unix, you can think of it as a uh, make files plus uh, Unix, Unix pipes plus something else. Uh, in terms of uh, features, what you do with Luigi, you define the dependencies between your tasks. So you have a pipeline made by many components. Each component depends on something else. And you can define this in Luigi by writing uh, very little Python code. And uh, you have some sort of error control and fa failure recovery out of the box. Uh, one nice uh, feature also of Luigi is the visualization of this dependency graph. Uh, one of the key concepts in uh, uh, Luigi is the task. So a Luigi task is a, just a task, nothing more, a unit of uh, execution. And uh, what you see here is all the code you need to write uh, in order to define your task. So you define your task as a class, which is standard the Luigi task, and then you need to define three methods. First one requires, you just write down the list of dependencies, so what this task is depending on. Then you define your output. This will be uh, maybe a file or a piece of data in the database. And then finally, the business logic of your task is defined in the run method. If you broke down the uh, pipeline into packages, and you have your own libraries. So what you write here basically is just uh, your library <coughs> dot run or your library dot main, whatever you call it. So really, the, the extra code that you need to write to get the uh, dependency uh, controlled is really small. Another uh, core concept of Luigi is the target, which is the output uh, of a task, a target either exists or not. So the only function that you need to define here is exists, and it will return a true or false. Uh, nice thing about Luigi and the, the kind of the ecosystem, uh, the community, is that uh, people have written already a lot of uh, targets for many, many different uh, um, types of data. So Amazon S3, Elasticsearch, uh, many, many database systems. You can find everything in the Luigi contrib package. So this is coming kind of out of the box. Uh, if you have a, you know, a new exotic uh, uh, database system uh, that is not, uh, that has not Luigi support yet, uh, you just need to write that kind of class. Uh, so I mentioned Luigi because I had uh, some uh, positive experience with Luigi, but I'm, I'm not trying to sell you Luigi. What I'm trying to sell you is the concept of uh, workflow managers. And there are many options today. In particular, Airflow, Mr. Job, and Pinball. These are all uh, Python-based libraries. So when I chose Luigi, uh, at the time, uh, all these were far behind in terms of feature, in terms of uh, community support. So Luigi was a bit more mature, a bit more complete. I think nowadays, they're pretty much on, uh, on the same level. What I like about Luigi is that uh, the extra effort in terms of uh, Python code that you need is really, really minimal. OK, uh, another concept that is often uh, uh, neglected when, uh, when uh, we write uh, academic code that has to go in production is the concept of logging. Uh, a few weeks back, uh, uh, there was Alex Martelli giving uh, a keynote at uh, PyCon Italy. And he said the logging library is uh, something that scares people off because it's so rich. Uh, the problem here is. Uh, yeah, it's true that uh, you can do a lot of stuff with, uh, with logging, but you can start with, uh, with the basics, really. So 
it's not difficult to, to start with. Uh, so import login, part of the standard library again. Why is it better than just printing uh, for debugging? Because you can uh, customize everything. So you can customize your log format and you have uh, extensive information already available in the login. For example, what kind of, uh, uh, which line is, is uh, causing the problem, what kind of uh, severity you want to highlight. So you want info, you want uh, debug, you want uh, errors, different levels of, uh, of information that you want to log. And uh, once you slot your login uh, functions in your code, uh, it's very easy to switch it off and it's very easy to decide uh, what you want to see and what you want to hide. On the other side, if you go through uh, the classic print function for debugging, then you have to go back and uh, either remove it or touch your code again and again. Instead, login is, uh, is kind of a production ready. And then you can decide whether you want to see your logs uh, uh, on the screen or you want to save it on, uh, on some file and so on. Uh, so login, uh, you run your pipeline overnight, uh, go to the office in the morning, first thing you do is not uh, reading the logs. Right? So you need some sort of a mechanism, some sort of trigger that will tell you if something goes uh, wrong. In particular with Luigi, you have uh, uh, an email notification system already out of the box. So you can get an email with the last uh, uh, traceback if you have an exception run, uh, happening in your code. Uh, or uh, you can also use one of the many integrations. In particular, I'm working on uh, this Luigi Slack integration. It's a work in progress that is basically pushing uh, a message on, uh, on your Slack channel or on a private, uh, as a private message. And uh, you can get uh, some sort of report about uh, the pipeline execution. Now in summary, the uh, starting point was uh, R&D is not engineering, and the question is can we meet uh, halfway? Uh, my answer is yes. Usually I don't like when uh, companies build uh, a huge wall between the R&D team and the uh, production engineering team. I prefer to kind of sit in the middle and, uh, and bring the two teams together. And one way to do that uh, is uh, uh, learning some basic engineering principles. I mentioned testing, I mentioned logging, I mentioned the way of packaging and refactoring things. And uh, these are really basics that you can, uh, um, you can benefit from even if you stay on the academic side. So even if you don't have to go to production, if you think in terms of in terms of production, still you can benefit from it and uh, uh, your code overall will, uh, will improve and uh, will give you better chances of, uh, of working on what you like basically. So you spend less time debugging, more time doing analysis. I mentioned uh, replicability as uh, something important in science and uh, of course in engineering as well. Automation, everything that can be automated probably should be automated because uh, Otherwise you get bored. And when you get bored is when you make mistakes. Right? So using the tools out there that are already uh, well prepared and feature rich, for example, Luigi, but any of the workflow manager is going to be helpful. Uh, and uh, before uh, uh, closing, I just want to mention the slides on, on the speaker deck. The uh, Luigi Slack uh, component is in my GitHub and I'll write everything also on the Slack channel. Uh, also, I'm fairly easy to find, and uh, if you want to reach out, uh, that's quite easy. Uh, I think that's all for me. Any question? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> question here? Yeah, I have a question. I'm so bad at the question that you do. Is the writer that print didn't print this Python 3 along with the. Oops, sorry, I didn't get that. Yes, the question is about uh, not using uh, print uh, and using the login uh, uh, package. Uh, I, I use login in Python 3. I use nearly for every project only uh, Python 3. Uh, the point is uh, print uh, is much less flexible than login. Why would you want to redefine it if it's already there? 
So the login is, is much more flexible in terms of uh, changing the configuration after you slot in all your login information. With print, you don't have uh, the same kind of flex flexibility. So I write my login once, and then I only change one line at the beginning of the file to change the configuration. That's all you need to do. If you want to switch it off, redirect somewhere, change the severity, and so on. So print, print is not flexible. That, that's that's uh, the short answer. Yes. Are these text files the, uh, the actual matrix? Yeah. How's the unit cost of each unit actually? Yeah, that's, uh, that's not easy. Uh, you can use assertions. So it, it depends on what you do with your so Jupyter notebooks. Uh, uh, the fire alarm system is operating in city gate house. Do not use the links between okay. these buildings until further notice. Okay. <laughs> okay, we're not uh, we're not using the lift. So. The fire alarm system is operating in city gate house. Yeah. Yeah, the suggestion if uh, it depends on uh, what you're using your notebooks for, and uh, probably uh, defensive programming in this case is more useful. So you you slot in assertions rather than writing the the proper unit test here, uh, and then as you execute your notebook, uh, if something is wrong, uh, you will see <coughs> errors. That's not a bad idea. So the, the problem is that they write it in the notebook, and then yeah. you have to move that into production. Okay. Um, Assertions, uh, yeah, you simply you, you, you test a particular condition, so an engineer can easily read an assertion and translate it into a unit test. Uh, usually you don't write assertions as, as I did uh, in production code because, uh, first of all, if you run uh, uh, Python in uh, non-debug mode, which is what you should do in production, assertions are uh, silenced. And uh, secondly, because you don't want uh, your code to just blow randomly in production, you want to test it on the side. So I think um, defensive programming as a, as a place in the, in, the, in the ecosystem, I don't particularly like it uh, when I build products, but I think in notebooks uh, it makes sense in general. Yeah. Yes? Regarding Zurich, is there a difference between the speed and volume of data passing through, or can you scale it up? So uh, in terms of uh, scalability of Luigi, uh, they recommend uh, to use it up to maybe tens of thousands of jobs per day, no more. It's oriented to batch processing. So if you need something more real time and, and in the millions of jobs kind of scale, uh, probably you should look into something like salary and uh, you're going to be a lot more involved on the, on the DevOps side. So salary, just to mention, is a is a, is a job queue, basically. So you need uh, some sort of backend, some sort of uh, message uh, broker, and uh, that, you know, it's, it's beyond uh, R&D usually. There's a lot of DevOps uh, involved. So I guess tens of thousands of, of jobs is still fine. Uh, you can uh, specify how many workers you want in a, in a single machine. It's uh, pure Python. Uh, what you run uh, doesn't have to be Python. So you can call uh, something external, okay. and uh, Luigi will, will just be the glue around your, uh, your pipeline. Do you happen to know how the um, dependency uh, sort of tree works in Luigi? Is it, is it, is it the task of polling you know, the outputs regularly, or, or okay. is it just pre build and then? So how does the dependency tree work? So it's a DAG directly graph, you define it in your code uh, when you write your task, and uh, Luigi will uh, read your code. Uh, when you run Luigi, you're saying, uh, uh, I want this task to be run, so the end of the pipeline, and then uh, Luigi will uh, kind of read uh, the DAG uh, backwards, and uh, we'll try to see uh, what kind of task you've run already and what you, you didn't, and uh, it's static. Okay, so you define your, your graph at the beginning, and then you run Luigi. You don't, you don't have a dynamic uh, uh, aspect of it. So that's, again, salary is prob probably a uh, better tool for this job. If you have uh, uh, new jobs coming dynamically and uh, you want to throw them in, in your pipeline. Uh, so yeah, with Luigi, you define a DAG. And with most of uh, 
workflow managers <coughs> that I mentioned, you just define your DAG at the beginning. Yeah, in the back. So end-to-end -end testing. Yeah. So end-to-end -end testing, uh, you need to do something, right? So uh, you should uh, test your components in, uh, in isolation, so run uh, your component with real data in isolation. So I'm not talking unit tests, I'm talking end-to-end -end tests for the individual component. And then uh, you can either test your end-to-end uh, -end, uh, pipeline uh, with Luigi or uh, kind of triggering the individual tasks manually. Um, I think it doesn't really matter as long as, uh, as, you, um, as you do something about it. Um, you don't have to, to kind of test Luigi. You have to run Luigi and test your code. So that, that's a subtle difference here. So test your expectations with Luigi, but don't test Luigi per se. One more in the back. Do you talk about code managers or do you just learn the support from people like them or is it just a software? So the one uh, work for managers uh, support in terms of other languages. The ones I mentioned are pure Python, but you can call external tools. So you can have, a, say, a Java or Scala application and you can call the JVM from Python. Or you can call any uh, Unix uh, uh, command line uh, kind of tool or whatever you like. So the, the Python code that you write is just the definition of your uh, uh, pipeline and uh, how the individual components uh, work or if there is a database in the middle or Elasticsearch or whatever, uh, that's fine f from the Luigi's point of view and also from the other um, workflow managers. It's kind of a, like I'm writing make files in, a, in some sort of sense. Yes. Is, does Luigi have sort of scheduling and is it a long running process or something? Uh, so the question is whether you, you can trigger the pipeline from Luigi. Uh, short answer, no. Uh, and the question uh, kind of uh, comes up uh, more and more, so probably it's not so obvious. When I first was looking into Luigi, for me it was quite clear the, the separation of defining the pipeline, that is what you do in Luigi, and running the pipeline. Uh, and I've seen this uh, explained as a, maybe a shortcoming of Luigi. What you have to do is uh, you have three options. Either you run uh, the pipeline manually or you use a cron job to uh, schedule the, the pipeline or you integrate your pipeline with, uh, say, Jenkins or any other CI tool. So in this way you can also inject uh, some uh, environment information uh, into the pipeline. So. No, there is no mechanism built in in Luigi to run the pipeline uh, with some sort of a cron or, or so you need to use uh, external tools. Yes? So an example of what you've used Luigi for for the original yes. project? Yes, uh, everything. <laughs> <laughs> so ex ex real life examples of Luigi. Uh, I'm working mainly in uh, NLP. Uh, so in NLP you have uh, more or less a bunch of pre-processing uh, steps that you always want to do or at least you want to try. So tokenization, stemming, stop or removal, the entity extraction, the usual things. Right. And sometimes you don't know which one works best for your, uh, for your data set. Yeah. And that's, that's one, of, one of the examples. Another example is uh, Right now I'm working in um, recruitment data, so matching uh, candidate profiles with uh, job spe specification with some machine learning. And then we have uh, data cleaning, duplicate profiles, uh, uh, profiles that are not really uh, well defined, so we want to augment uh, with, uh, with uh, additional labels. And uh, all, this, uh, all these steps uh, are applied to different data sets. So we have a few steps in parallel and then we kind of merge everything and it's, you know, naturally it looks like a DAG. So we define it uh, with Luigi, so it's quite straightforward. But really, uh, because the, the extra code that you need to write with Luigi is so small, uh, it makes sense to use it every time you need to, to do some pre-processing step. One question? 
Yeah. Someone asked about this magazine title, Dada, that you don't like to give you, but I know I have the obvious question. Uh, when do you recommend using the review book? When? Because I work in uh, an academic research, so we like we don't want just to go back to Dada, and I use Magpie. Uh, I have my uh, directed graph in, in Magpie, and it explains me in, in the past because we need five files from the tools, and I don't really want to skip to like, two hundred or thousand lines of five minutes of the same document. Yeah, so the question is about uh, the, the entry barrier to, to Luigi. I think, um, personally, I'm very comfortable with Unix, so I like make files and all the weird things. Uh, but um, I've spoken to people in uh, biology, chemistry, so they are domain expert in whatever they are studying, and, but they are not uh, software engineers, so they don't want to bother. And uh, Luigi is nice because you don't write that much code. So the concept is quite simple. You, you write a DAG, and the extra code uh, <laughs> is Python. So probably you are already familiar with Python. And uh, there's really not much work to do. If, you, if your pipeline is uh, two steps, uh, maybe you don't need a workflow manager, but you know, from, from three steps uh, up, maybe it's nice. And uh, you, have a, you have a bunch of uh, features um, out of the box, like uh, error control and uh, rerun in the pipeline if, if something breaks halfway through. You rerun it, uh, not from the beginning, but from the last uh, point of failure. Uh, so I, I definitely recommend a, a workflow manager in general. And uh, as I said, I mentioned Luigi because I'm happy with, uh, with Luigi. From the back, yeah? Suitable to? It's uh, oriented to uh, batch processing, so it really depends. Uh, if batch processing is, is what you need, uh, then you can use Luigi. If you need something more real time, uh, uh, then uh, wor workflow managers in general are, are not what you need. You probably need to be a bit more involved on the uh, message passing around. Uh, so that's, that's my short answer on that, yeah. Uh, I think we, we run out of time. Uh, I can take the next few questions during the, the coffee break. Yeah. You're around all weekend. I'm here all weekend, and you can find me at the uh, meetup as well. Thank you.